Today is September 24th, 2017, and we're here in the offices of New Inter uh, Enterprise Associates with Peter Barris. Thank you, Peter. We're Good morning. really delighted to have you here conducting your oral history for the Computer History Museum. So I'd like to uh, start by the beginning. Can you tell us about uh, where you were born and your early childhood? Sure. I uh, grew up in Chicago um, and lived there through my freshman year in high school. So, um, you know, relatively modest home in the city, went to public schools, uh, went to what I guess in today's terminology you'd call a magnet school for high school. It was a technical high school called Lane Tech. And um, uh, had a great childhood, uh, had two working parents, my father was a structural engineer by trade, ran an engineering department, my mother a housewife and did secretarial work and very involved in our church and uh, lived in a um, kind of a typical Chicago neighborhood, very ethnic, very diversified and um, it was a great background. And then my, my family moved to Ohio after my freshman year in high school, um, out, uh, a town outside of Youngstown, Ohio, which was a big change from the big city where I took buses to high school. <laughs> and, uh, and it was an all boys technical high school to then kind of the all American middle America high school. And, um, and uh, but I loved it there. I loved it in Ohio, and uh, and um, it was a big change from the big city, of course. But uh, uh, we, uh, I went back to Chicago to go to Northwestern as an undergrad, and and uh, went back uh, to major in electrical engineering. So I turned around and went back to my hometown. So deep roots in Chicago. Before we get to your college years, yep. I like to ask. What was sort of the world for you as, as you were growing up? What did you talk about at home? What were your activities, interests in politics, education, religion, um, yeah. arts? So, you know, my, my, uh, it was interesting. My mother was a very hardworking person and a, and a, and a leader. Okay, particularly as I mentioned in in our church, my parents are both of Greek heritage, yes, and so we had a very strong family unit with not only my family but my extended family, so grandparents and cousins and a little bit like the movie Big Fat Greek Wedding, if you're familiar with <laughs> yes. that. So it's bringing all kinds of yeah, images that, to my mind. <laughs> that was the environment I grew up in, and it was a very loving environment. And I think I learned a lot of uh, different things from each of my parents. So my mother, as I mentioned, was a, a very hardworking leader in many organizations within her church community and broadly in the Midwest and nationally, actually, mm. all church related. So she was the kind of person that would uh, also had a job, would come home from work and then work at home, mm. uh, as did my father, frankly. So but he did it in his professional engineering uh, profession. He'd come, come home from a day of work and he'd work at home. So I saw, I observed in both of my parents two very hardworking people. Um, my father had a college degree, my mother did not. And so my father was a bit of a renaissance man. Even though he was an engineer, he was both left brain, right brain, so he would author fictional articles. He was an artist. He played the mandolin. Hmm. And so he was a, I'd, I say, a left brain, right brain kind of guy. And so was very interested in music and reading. And so I got very involved, not in music. I have zero in the way of musical abilities, but I did read a lot as a result, I think, of my father's influence. In but my mother taught me a lot about leadership, frankly. Hmm. Uh, what were some of the books that have kind of stayed with you from those early years? Oh, gee, going back. I mean, I, I, I don't think there was a particular book that influenced me. You know, I read all the classics that you would expect. Uh, you know, both those that were kind of dictated by school and, and otherwise. But I can't sit there at least at that time and point to a book that 
influenced how I move forward in life. Mm. But, you know, it was the influence of my parents. My father was very focused on how I did at school and the grades mm. I got, and he had ambitions for me. You know, my mother was more the, you know, let's make sure you're a well-rounded person and a good person. And, um, and I think both were good and both very influential in how I viewed the world. Well, thank you. You talked about making the decision to return to your hometown to go to college. How did you make the decision to go to Northwestern and start to choose your major and then ultimately what you decided to move into for your, your um, career path? Yeah, well, it was... Uh, at the time, I, I, in high school, I, I joined the debate team at my high school, and we were, uh, our, our, our speech team broadly and debate team were amongst the best in the state of Ohio, and we competed every weekend, and I loved it. And, um, and so at that point in my life, I was trying to decide what I was going to do with my life, and I so loved the debate experience that it naturally led me to think I wanted to be a lawyer. And um, <clears throat> my father, again, the ambitious one for me, uh, n knowing I had an aptitude in math and science in terms of testing, et cetera, and being an engineer himself was pushing me to get an engineering degree and ultimately become a patent attorney. Because he said that's how you can differentiate yourself from the glut of attorneys in the market. Go, you know, take what you're good at, math and science, and leverage it. And so he sold me on that concept, and I looked at uh, colleges uh, in the Midwest because um, uh, I really didn't think about going far from home, if you will, um, that were both strong in engineering and strong in law school. Mm -hmm. And that's what led me to Northwestern because it had premier uh, uh, departments in both. And uh, ultimately, I love the fact that it was a medium-sized university, yet it had, um, it was a Big Ten experience, and it had the whole ball of wax, so to speak. And so that's what led me there, and I was comfortable. It was back in my hometown. I had family around, etc. Little did I know my parents were going to move back to Chicago a year later, which w was one of those moments when I thought I was getting away from my family and going away <laughs> to school and they announced after my freshman year they were moving back to Chicago. It was not, not a good moment, but it turned out great. As I <coughs> understand, you started on that career path for patent law and then uh, changed direction. Can you talk about what you decided to study and ultimately graduate in? Yeah, I did. So I was in electrical engineering and one of the reason I chose electrical engineering besides a general interest in the area was that and chemical were the areas that were most relevant to patent, patent law. So I envisioned myself being the debater as standing in front of juries um, uh, on big patent infringement cases and arguing the case. And then in my junior year in college I took a course, an elective course on law for engineers half the course was taught by a patent attorney. And so I got chummy with him and he told me what patent law was really about. And when I understood that I'd spend the first five years of my existence buried in a patent law library and not, not standing in front of juries arguing cases, and I got the reality, so to speak, of what it was really like, I decided I wasn't as interested in it as I thought I was. And I got you know, at the time, I think uh, MBAs were becoming in vogue, and the business world intrigued me um, for a lot of different reasons. And so by the time I graduated, I did take my, my uh, LSATs, because I hadn't given up entirely on the thought of going to law school, but I was migrating away from it. And, and I also took my GMATs. And, uh, but I spent a year uh, working in an engineering consulting firm. In fact, while I was in college, I was on a co-op program, a work-study program, so it took five years to get my degree. And I worked for a consulting engineering firm in Chicago, and I continued working there for a year afterwards. 
before I went back to business school. Were there any uh, professors or classmates, people that had an influence for you during those college years? Yeah, I, I'd say particularly in, um, uh, in, in business school, uh, a professor by the name of Brian Quinn, who, uh, who managed both business policy, which was a required course, and a strategic course, and he, ma and he, and he also managed the entrepreneurship channel, if you will, of courses, which there weren't a lot of back in those days. I'm dating myself now, so this That's was 75 early. to 77. But what you're expecting me to say is I took all these entrepreneurship courses, which I did not. The influence was business policy. I loved the strategy of business. I loved the discussion and the discourse we had in the classroom on how companies evolved and succeeded and in some cases failed, how they dealt with competition, how they dealt with adversity. Um, we also had a computer driven competition, a one week long competition as part of that course. And my, the company which I was president of and our, our group of five won that competition. So I was very invigorated by the broad concept of business and the broad concept mm -hmm. of strategy and how to how to evolve businesses and succeed. I was not interested at all in entrepreneurship at the time. So mm -hmm. it was the traditional go to work, I mean go to work at a big company and that was my plan to leave Tuck at Dartmouth, which is where I went to business school, and go to work for a big company. And that's ultimately what I did. And so Entrepreneurship, interestingly enough, even though it was run by my favorite professor, was okay. not something that I grabbed onto at that point in my, my evolution. I'd like to go back just a little bit and talk about your Northwestern years. Um, I've heard that, I think <laughs> this is true, that you were very involved in extracurriculars. Uh, yeah, I was. I was. I was involved in extracurriculars. I was not your typical engineer because remember, mm -hmm. it was a means to an end for me. Uh, and so um, I got very, again, kind of left brain, right brain. I got very involved in some of the creative disciplines, if you will, at Northwestern. So I was a, a producer of a of what is to this day the largest student-run musical in the country. It's a dolphin Dolphin show, show is what it was called. It, Tell it, us it had its more beginnings in actually in a swimming pool, which is why it's called Dolphin Show. But it, it evolved over the years and prior to my time to being on, on stage performance. And so, you know, I got involved in that uh, early on in the promotional aspects and the normal support and then got to the point where I was the co-producer of the show. And so I was very involved in, I'll call it the theater side of Northwestern as well as other things that you would expect, uh, things, Wildcat Council, I was on the newspaper for the engineering school. Um, ultimately, I, I, I started and ran a, a, a spring weekend that has now evolved into a major event at the university. And so where we got a big band, uh, you know, a nationwide known band and brought them to campus and on the beach, because Northwestern's on, lake, on the beach on Lake Michigan. And so I got involved in a lot of activities to the point where um, I was inducted into an honorary society of where 15, um, both a junior and senior honorary society, where 15 men are elected into this honorary society for both scholarship and leadership. And so, uh, you know, that again, it was kind of left brain, right brain, right brain. I was involved in a fraternity, not the typical engineering student, I'd say. Um, and engineering, frankly, didn't come easy to me. You know, it was one of those things where I, it was hard work for me. The engineering side of it was hard work for me, whereas I'd go and take an economics class with economics major, and it was easy, and I'd ace it. So 
I always thought about switching majors, but I stuck it out, and I'm glad I stuck it out. And because um, it gave me, uh, it taught me a certain rigor in how you think about things and problem solving. That um, you know, the the education itself was probably obsolete one year after I left college because of the technological change. But the problem solving aspect of it and how you think through problems and solve problems was something that I lean on, I think, to this very day. After Northwestern, as you mentioned, you chose Tuck and went to Dartmouth. Yeah. What was behind that decision? Well, my um, best friend in high school went to Dartmouth as an undergrad. And so that influenced me because he had a great experience there. Um, you know, at the time, uh, as I looked at the highly ranked business schools, it was clearly in the top five in business schools. And um, I had a, uh, uh, a girlfriend who worked for digital equipment. She's now my wife. Okay. And um, story turned she, out well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. She would often. Uh, she worked in the finance department, and she would often travel to suburban Boston, Maynard, which is where mm -hmm. digital equipment was uh, based at the time. And so, to me, it was an opportunity to get a different experience. I wanted a different experience um, than Northwestern. Uh, although I did apply to Kellogg and got accepted to Kellogg, but I. Uh, um, amongst other business schools, but I, I love the thought of going off into the woods of New Hampshire for two years into a small school and a very intimate experience. Mm -hmm. uh, then as today, they advertise themselves, Tuck does, as a school that's got a very, um, uh, I think, strong community. Uh, uh, and um, where the, all the focus is on MBAs and not on doctoral students, et cetera, they don't have a PhD program in business. And so I love that aspect of it. And I said, I'm going to spend the rest of my life in a major metropolitan area, so I might as well have this experience. And, um, and I got the benefit of seeing my then girlfriend fairly frequently. And um, although it didn't take long, before I went away, left that I actually got engaged. So I realized as I was in the woods of Hanover, New Hampshire, that it, maybe I made a mistake leaving my girlfriend. <laughs> 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 she wasn't happy about the fact that I, I chose to go there. And um, but I, you know, I, I would always say to her, "Well, I didn't go to the West Coast because I got accepted to a school, a well-known school on the West Coast as well." And I decided to go to the East Coast for her. So that's what I did for her. But. Uh, I realized really quickly that she was the woman for me, and then we, we got engaged about two months later, and she joined me after we got married in between my first and second year. So but to your question of why I went there, I went there because of the intimacy of the program, the fact that I had a great friend that had gone to Dartmouth and had convinced me that it was a great place, and I wanted a different experience. Well, you have these major pillar decisions um, made at that time. You mentioned your fascination and love of building businesses in this broad spectrum. Was there anything else that you look back that you'd, you continue to draw on from those Tuck years? So, t so Tuck for me was a pivot point. Uh, uh, coming out of an engineering program where you didn't have an opportunity to take a lot of electives, um, uh, wanting to go into the business world but not knowing a lot about it frankly I mean I when I went to Tuck I didn't know what investment banking was uh, so I realized I needed to pivot and what better way to pivot but to go to a business school get an MBA and then expose myself to a lot of things I hadn't been exposed to which is exactly what happened and so um, uh, it, it seemed natural to me from a functional standpoint, I gravitated to the marketing discipline rather than something like finance. And I think it goes back to the fact that I loved business strategy. And marketing as a discipline seemed to me at the time to represent the discipline that gave me the best opportunity to exercise business strategy and to exercise the creative side of myself, if you will, to grow a business. And so 
the, to the extent you major, and you don't, re you didn't really major in anything back then at business school. I, I took a lot of courses in marketing, with the intent of going into an industrial company because I wanted to leverage my engineering background, and my love of technology. I didn't want to go to a consumer marketing company, um, uh, and to go to something to, to a, a business that had a technology foundation. And during the course of my work as an engineering consultant, I had the opportunity to take a class at General Electric for a week in their lighting division. I came away from that class very, very impressed with the organization and their professionalism and the, the depth of talent that I met during the course of that week, et cetera. So I was attracted to General Electric specifically amongst a variety of companies, but I was attracted to General Electric and an opportunity did come along that was a little unusual at GE and I grabbed it. I want to hear that opportunity on yeah. the bulletin board, I think, uh, where yeah. you found out that. Could you help us give a little context though? This is the mid-70s. Yeah. What was the landscape of technology companies that you were maybe considering in HUT and General Electric's place in that at the time for the Well, United you know, States. technology companies back then in, in were major corporations like GE and IBM. They weren't the Microsofts of the world. Those companies hadn't come along. I'd have to think back, I guess, he, did Hewlett Packard have its beginnings then? I didn't, I didn't really think, it had its Started beginnings. Started in 39. But, yeah, but it, you know, I thought of large industrial companies, mm -hmm. a lot of them chemically based companies in the chemical world, et cetera. So they, they, m many of which aren't even around today, frankly. You know, they were the AT&Ts of the world. So the tele big telecom companies, IBM was a very notable one at the time. Um, sure. So those were the kinds of companies I thought about. N nothing you would think about in today's tech world. None of the companies you would think about as leading companies in today's tech world. It's the nature of the technology change, isn't it? It is. So this unusual opportunity came. Can you tell what that was and, and yeah. how did you grab onto it? Sure. So I, it, it, was a, it was an opportunity on a bulletin board, frankly. It was um, GE came on campus and interviewed for their standard Jo entry level jobs, and I did go to those interviews. But there, there was I noticed on the career bulletin board an opportunity uh, for a unique program that was just starting up, frankly, at the plastics division in Pittsfield, Massachusetts, and they were coming to Tuck for to hire somebody from Tuck specifically for this job working for the head of strategic planning. Strategic planning was a big deal back then. Mm -hmm. And GE had kind of uh, engineered it and led it. And many companies followed it. So it was an opportunity to do this. And I, 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 I wrote in and answered that. that. Now that led to a different job. But that's the job I, um, uh, I went after. Um, and looked into, and it, it, it was an unusual situation because they, uh, as they kind of screened out students, they brought a limo up to Hanover, New Hampshire, and drove three Tuck, cla three Tuck students, two of my classmates and myself, to Pittsfield, Massachusetts for a day of interviews. So there were three of us, frankly, all friends, pitted against each other, and only one of us was going to get the job. Um, and, uh, and it was a great day, frankly, and it was a unique job. Uh, but the job I ultimately ended up with was not that one. Um, uh, the the, the uh, plastics division had, um, was one of five that was um, managed by a group led by Jack Welsh called the Components and Materials Group. And he had started this program of hiring an MBA out of school two years earlier where he went to Harvard. And he had hire, hired two Harvard students. And on that particular year, um, he decided to expand the program. 
to five of his divisions. So they went to five different schools. They went to Tuck and they went to Wharton and they Chicago and Northwest for different divisions. And as I said, Tuck was the school they went to for the plastics division, which happened to be the division that Jack Welsh grew up in, which is why he ran his group also in Pittsfield, Massachusetts, which was unusual because everybody else at his level was at the corporate headquarters, which was then in Fairfield, Connecticut. But he ran his group out of a small office in Pittsfield, Massachusetts, and he oversaw a big part, the, the material, it was called Components and Materials. So it was all the materials businesses, plastics, silicones, components like appliance components, electronic components, and a couple of miscellaneous businesses, I'll call it, like med systems and batteries. But he had this fiefdom, if you will, that he ran out of uh, Pittsfield, and he, he hired an MBA to come in for one year as, I'll call it, a roving consultant, where you'd go out and do project-oriented uh, activities at these divisions at Jack Welsh's behest. Um, he kind of struck out that year, and that was my good fortune, and the candidates that he saw from Harvard. And so the person that was running the, uh, uh, the, the screening process said, well, you ought to talk to this guy, Peter Barris. So I, uh, I got the nod to go to his office and work for, um, again, it was the head of strategic planning at the group level, a guy by the name of Greg Lehman, who became my mentor in business, that hired me. But it was, it was a small office. It was only eight people. And so I went through a, a day of very rigorous interviews, and I'd say to this day probably the most intimidating set of interviews I've been through. That's a lot. <laughs> uh, tell us about those interviews. That's something. That well, you, you know, I was the lightweight. I was the 20-some-year-old kid in an office of senior executives, and they had one other, I'll call it junior, but far older than me, person in finance, and then me. Everybody else was a senior executive at GE, and I came in for a day of interviewing the, you know, the, obviously the man that was hiring me in strategic planning, the, the senior vice president of finance, senior vice president legal counsel, senior vice president human resource, and I kind of passed through all that, and they said, okay, now you're gonna meet Welsh, and then I had to cool my heels for an hour and a half. And um, I didn't know who Jack Welsh was. You know, I mean, I didn't really understand that he was a rising star in the company. And um, when I first met him, he said, uh, well, you weren't supposed to get this far. So that was the intro to, I guess, comfort me and put me at ease. Put you at ease. <laughs> <laughs> and during the course of the interview, he, he would um, he'd say things like, you know, well, we're looking for people that, um, you know, would, uh, that, uh, that, can consult to our businesses and have an interest in consulting, frankly. And I, and but they were all they all well, they want people with technical backgrounds. So an engineering background was key to getting that job, frankly. Mm -hmm. I don't think I would have been there had I not had an engineering background. Um, and at one point in the interview, I said, "Well, you know, I've been a consulting engineer," and he said, "Well, that's just bullshit." And. Um, I said, well, that's not bullshit, and here's why that's not bullshit. And the, the importance of that is I later found out that the fact that I stood up to him was the reason I got that job. Okay. And um, <clears throat> uh, so uh, I stood up to him and I asked him a question. And I said, well, you've had this program where you've hired in an MBA, and um, at the end of one year, you shoot them out into one of your divisions, in a, into an operating role. Well, now you've introduced this program to the divisions, and they're all hiring MBAs out of school in these one-year programs. So where's the opportunity for me? They each have their guy. And he said, uh, if you do a good job here, you'll have an opportunity. That's what he said at the interview. But later, when he I'd say two months later, he had a dinner with all these MBAs. And he said, you want to know why I hired Peter Barris? And I was stunned because I, I didn't know what to expect. And he said, one, he stood up to me. 
and two, he showed political savvy by asking that question, which actually scared me because that then told me that my question was a good question <laughs> 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 and that his assurance that I had a job was something I shouldn't rest easy with. But, um, but that actually was a good life lesson uh, because one of the things I observed being around Jack Welsh for that year was that uh, he did not suffer fools. He challenged people very hard, and the people that wilted lost. And standing up to your convictions was important. Having convictions and standing up to them was important. And, uh, um, <coughs> and something that he used to delineate winners from losers, using his terminology. Thank you for sharing uh, that's, um, that beginning. So that beginning led to almost a decade at GE. Can you yeah. first start with what were your early assignments as you were this technology consultant roving around? What were you actually doing? Well, my first uh, project, uh, as it was, was at Medical Systems, which, which was in just outside of Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And they sent me there. There was a a bit of a controversy going on in terms of how they had were servicing medical equipment. So G was a leader in X-ray and CT scanners to this day is. Um, and uh, there was a, the controversy was whether they serviced the equipment on an hourly basis or on a contract basis. And there were different factions within the organization that took to those two different sides. And so Welsh said, go figure it out. So I was, again, this young whippersnapper being sent into this division of, I'll call it, warring parties. And nobody wanted to talk to me because Welsh had, in their view, Welsh had sent me. And there was, it was kind of a no win for them to really open up. And so uh, my client was the head of strategic planning for that division, who was on one side of the controversy. But I had to go in and ascertain what the real story was and then report back to my staff in Pittsfield, Massachusetts. And um, uh, the, w what I found in that project, frankly, was I uncovered a little bit of a Pandora's box because they were all arguing with bad information. They had bad information. Hmm. Hmm. And so the, the, the premise for their respective arguments was all uh, based on a poor foundation. And so <clears throat> that led to another project, to another project, and um, you know, ultimately they did resolve it, but and I got a job offer at Med Systems as a result of my work there, which I didn't take. But um, it was a great experience, and Welsh got because it was a bit of a controversy. Welsh got directly involved in it, so I, you know, I would be sitting in his office talking to him about what I was finding out, and then he'd get the division manager on the phone. And so, I, you know, I very early in my career was dealing with uh, issues at very high levels within the company. And that, that was an experience that I, I, uh, it'd be very difficult to replicate. You know, I saw firsthand uh, I got a glimpse into corporate politics, even though we weren't at the corporate headquarters. Uh, this was, uh, uh, I, I, you know, Welsh was advanced from there to a sector executive and from there to CEO of the company. And so he was enmeshed in the, I'll call it the politics of, of choosing the next CEO of GE, and I got a glimpse into that. So operating at that level early in my career, albeit for a relatively short period of time, was uh, instructive. I also got the opportunity to do projects at um, plastics, at battery business department, at silicones. So I saw a wide variety of businesses. 
I visited some of the other more, I'll call it legacy businesses, slower growing businesses like appliance components, etc. Which, by the way, taught me some important lessons. Some very simple things, like I'd go to appliance components in Indiana and I'd observe and meet with somebody, an older gentleman who I thought was incredibly impressive and was in GE parlance a level 13. Now this was a slow growing business that had been around for decades. And then I'd go to plastics, which was a high flying, you know, 30, 40 percent year over year business, very profitable. And I'd observe that this very young guy was a level 13. Very young and frankly not all that impressive. And I'd go, okay, they're both GE. What's going on here? And I'm just, and I saw that at many different businesses. And it occurred to me that market matters. So if you're in a business that's in a great market, like at that time plastics, fast growing, the opportunities abound, and people oftentimes get elevated beyond their, I'll call it level of competence, but the opportunity to grow is there. Whereas if you find yourself in a business that's not growing very fast, no matter how skilled you are and how capable you are, you may find yourself in a corner. And so it's those simple kinds of lessons that I learned very early in my, my uh, career at GE because I had this opportunity to observe all these different businesses, but they were all still under the same banner and they all had a commonality in, in terms of the GE culture but they were still different. And, and uh, so there were a lot of lessons I learned out of that that, again, I carried with me throughout my career. So it was a great opportunity. Very powerful. Those lessons are lessons that um, have sort of universal application. So they don't, do. Don't hold sure. back. Is there, a, is there another one that you'd like to share? Uh, well, you know, I learned so much in that job. The, um, you know, the, the interesting thing is I remember once having a discussion with, um, with uh, Jack Welsh one-on-one, -on -one, and uh, he was talking, and I, I think this was the title of one of his books, actually, later on, was Control Your Own Destiny. And he gave me examples of why that was important, et cetera, and frankly, uh, it was it was those very words that ultimately led me to leave GE because I found myself in a position much later on in, uh, when I was with GE Information Services that the um, company reorganized and and I was asked to move from my position I was managing a P&L center over a 23 state area for G information services at the time based out of Chicago coincidentally and they asked me to move back to Maryland to the headquarters into a, a promotion but here I am in my hometown very happy being around family having my first child and I woke up one day and uh, and the general manager had reorganized the company and it affected me in a way that I now had to pick up my family. Now I expected eventually I was going to pick up my family and move again because I had s several times with GE. But I was moving, in this case, for a reorganization I didn't believe in. Mm -hmm. So now this is affecting my life in a very profound way. Mm -hmm. I'm picking my family up, I'm moving. I, I get that I'm getting promoted. Um, but I don't agree with the reorganization and I'm not controlling my own destiny. And so Welsh's words to me had reverberated. Mm -hmm. And at that point, I kind of took stock of my situation and said, do I want to keep doing this or do I want to take a different path? Do I want to stay on a GE trajectory? And I love the company. To this day, I love the company. I learned so much from my uh, years at GE. Um, but, it, you know, uh, I learned very quickly also that you ultimately end up in these span breaker jobs, I'll call them, or they call them span breaker jobs, which once you're beyond a division manager, you're a manager of managers. 
and you don't have a business per se. Mm -hmm. And those are span breakers, which are necessary in a large organization, but you don't have your hands on the levers. And the next great job is CEO. And so I was getting to the point, I wasn't quite there, but I was getting to the point where I was gonna start getting into span breaker jobs. And where, where I would not be dedicated to an industry per se. And so I asked myself the question, having been a G Information Services, and I'm fast forwarding now, but having been a G Information Services, did I want to dedicate myself to the industry or did I want to dedicate myself to a company? And I made the choice to dedicate myself to the industry. So that was ultimately my decision. It was a very hard decision because I was doing well. It was a great company. I had learned a lot, but I made that decision. That, that decision led you to a whole new chapter. Uh, it did. And I wanted to ask, were you in some kind of a role that then brought out the interest in entrepreneurship? Yeah. So my, um, my first job, so I, I went from this staff level job uh, working for the Components and Materials Group to the Battery Business Department. And the reason I chose, which was one of the businesses within this group that I had done a project at, and I had opportunities at several of the businesses, but I chose that one because it was a small one. It was a small business within the context of GE, but it was a $50 million business. So uh, y you, you were a uh, big fish in a small pond, pond, so to speak, rather than being a small fish in a big pond. And I figured I could make a bigger impact by being at the battery business department rather than some place like plastics or med systems. And at that business, um, I learned a lot about the total business picture, if you will, because even though I had functional roles in marketing and sales, you were involved in a lot of aspects of the business, much like you are in startups. But it was at G Information Services, which I went to from Battery Business Department, that I got my first real exposure to entrepreneurship. And my job there was to start up new businesses within the context of G Information Services. So G Information Services was a time-sharing business. Uh, it actually was the commercialization of a system that was developed at Dartmouth that I used when I was at Dartmouth. Mm -hmm. that, um, so that's serendipity. But um, so I ended up at this business, but my first job was working for the vice president of marketing. And they, they saw that the days of time sharing were numbered. So we had large data centers and we had a global proprietary network. We had our own, this is back in the early 80s, we had our own internal system that today is called email, before anybody knew what email was. But we used it just internally. Um, and uh, so my job was to start up, start up new businesses. And again, it kind of brought out the creative side of me, the strategic side of me. All right, we have a business that's um, approximately Eight hundred million dollars in revenue. So, you know, back in the '70s or early '80s, that was a large business, um, and its days are numbered because time sharing as a technology is kind of as companies were um, building their own data centers rather than relying on time sharing. Uh, we had to figure out the future of our business, and so they put a lot of stock in this job to help the business figure out where else it could go. And so uh, I led a small group of people and we started up three different businesses. One that was a PC based business and PCs mm -hmm. were just coming into vogue. It was early for that. It was very early for that. One which was a networking business which was to extract our network our network was embedded in our time-sharing service, so we extracted it out and sold it as a communications mm -hmm. network solely rather than have it um, uh, linked to the computing side of, of the business. 
and then a, a banking business actually because we saw a lot of opportunity in global banking and building systems for international money centered banks and so that was more application driven so we started all three of those businesses and and two of them evolved into sizable businesses the PC based business did not it was a niche business and it stayed a niche business but the other two became actually sizable businesses within GE and what I discovered out of that process is my love for company creation and business creation even though it was under a corporate umbrella if you will it was still clean sheet starting a business and um, uh, later in my career at G Information Services I had the opportunity to acquire as I took on P&L responsibilities to acquire startups venture back startups so from that perspective um, I also got an introduction into the culture of many of these companies Silicon Valley based companies in some cases uh, and incorporating them into a GE culture which actually I would argue required you to understand how what made them tick perhaps even more than if they were just an independent company because you had to integrate them into this other hundred year old company culture and make it work and so uh, that forcing function, if you will, really forced me to understand what made these companies tick. And so my love of entrepreneurship, my love of the startup world, I think started, not, not I think, I know, started there, started with that experience. So I didn't, as I said, have it when I was in business school at all. I was the big company guy. And it was through these set of experiences at a big company that I actually uh, discovered my love for entrepreneurship. So with this love of entrepreneurship you said your decision to control your destiny came and then right. you decided to leave GE and begin this next era of really right. leading software companies. Can you make that segue right. and tell yeah. us what's next? Yeah, so next was a, a public a New York Stock Exchange company in Dallas, Texas. Um, so as I was looking around, I made this decision that I was uh, going to dedicate myself to the computer industry, if you will, because I saw tremendous growth and opportunity in the industry. I didn't exactly know where to go. I was going to leave GE. I was evaluating opportunities at GE in parallel to this. Because um, uh, frankly, they were trying to keep me within the fold of the company. Uh, I looked at some startups in Silicon Valley, um, but I got pulled by Greg Lemont, who was this guy that hired me at, at Components and Materials Group out of Tuck. He had left GE, and he was Welsh's golden boy, frankly, and it was kind of stunning to the company that he left to take over this turnaround New York Stock Exchange company called University Computing Corp., which was renamed UCEL, U-C-C-E-L, never liked that name. But uh, he went in to do this turnaround. It was a New York Stock Exchange company, uh, a little odd because it was majority owned by a Swiss billionaire. Um, and what was good about that was uh, we were able, we obviously had all the reporting requirements of a public company, but we were able because we had a controlling shareholder to manage it somewhat like a private company. And uh, Greg was an amazing um, uh, business and, uh, person. I had utmost respect for him. And he convinced me to join, uh, join him, initially in a corporate development role, although I balked at that because I was coming from a substantial P&L responsibility and I didn't know if I wanted to go back into a staff position, but he assured me that ultimately it would lead back to an operating role, but he needed help to restructure that business. And so um, it frankly was a little comforting to be with somebody I knew and respected, 
Yes. There were elements of the GE culture there because he brought a few other GE people with him. And, um, and yet I was taking this step out of the only company I really knew, GE, into this brave new world. And it had all the elements I loved. This was a mini conglomerate, if you will. It had uh, system software, banking application software, numerical control software, accounting application software, a variety of businesses. And it was uh, barely break even. And the question was, where do we take the company? So we applied, frankly, some of the principles we learned at GE. You know, if you're not, Jack Welsh had this, if you're not number one or number two, you're either going to find a way to become number one or number two in your industry, or you're out. And so we looked at all our different businesses with that same kind of filter. And so <coughs> I led the sale of half of our revenue stream. Companies and businesses that represented half of our revenue stream. And then the acquisition of several companies, again, many of them startups, that supported two fundamental businesses that we bet on, systems software, which was the big one, and banking application software, which I had a background in. Uh, and that's what we put our bets on. So we had probably eight or nine different businesses prior to that. We narrowed it down to two and we put all our bets on those two. From a lot of the funds that we received from the sale of those companies, we reinvested in these two areas. And then I was put in charge of the system software business, which was 85% of the company at the time. And again, we were a public company. And uh, so I managed that business. And um, so that was a great experience, again, kind of taking all that I had learned from a strategy side um, uh, and helping figure out what was the best path for UCEL going forward. Um, we quadrupled in very short order the market value of the company and ultimately sold it. We got an offer from Computer Associates at a 50% premium to what some people would argue was already a premium price on the market. It was something, frankly, that several of us, myself included, didn't want to accept the offer, but we didn't have a choice. Um, I learned a very uh, hard lesson. Uh, our, our majority owner, the Swiss gentleman, didn't want to sell the company, but he was told by lawyers if he didn't, he was subject personally to treble damages from the lawsuits he'd get from the other public shareholders. Being a controlling shareholder actually had an obligation mm -hmm. uh, alongside it. He couldn't do what he personally wanted to do. He had to do what was in the interests of all the shareholders, right? And getting a premium offer, we sold the company. Um, I, I was asked to move to Long Island and become part of the senior management team at Computer Associates, chose not to do that. Um, and found myself uh, in a transition, helping to transition the business for six months, but basically unemployed at the end of the six months. You'd been so successful. Congratulations <laughs> on that. It was time for what was next, which um, then led to you thinking about taking this entrepreneurial drive and creating your own company. Well, Is actually, that right? what, or yeah, there no, something what, else? What no, what happened was. Um, I, I decided at that point, my wife and I decided we were going to, uh, we had been moving around a lot through mm -hmm. my career at GE and then this move to Dallas and we decided we wanted to settle in one place and um, we were either going to stay in Dallas, move back to our hometown of Chicago or go to, we liked Washington, we had been there with GE Information Services and I got a job offer from a guy who had Mario Marino who I had been in the middle of negotiating to buy one of his products uh, from his company and put it in our stable of products, system software products. And when we had the offer from Computer Associates, he called me up and said, look, he was the founder and CEO. He said, I want a, I want a president for my company. I'm not an operating guy. You have this You've been running UCEL, which was uh, one of the larger um, 
our system software business was clearly one of the largest uh, in the industry, and he said, why don't you come and be president of my company? He had gone public a year and a half earlier on NASDAQ, so it was a public company. Um, so I came in as president. Of, I, again, it was here in Washington, so I came came to Washington and, and managed that company and and grew it. We What was that one called? That was called Marino Associates, but we merged with another company uh, called Duquesne Systems, also in system software, and renamed that company Legion, and I was the president of Legion, this combined entity, a NASDAQ traded company. Now, you know, both of these companies were venture back companies. They were both entrepreneurial companies in their early days, and they had both gone on to become public companies, but were still relatively modest in size. So they had that entrepreneurial spirit. I felt comfortable. It was system software. I could lead a public company. Um, so I took that role, again, from a strategy standpoint. We decided to merge with Duquesne. Um, we were off to the races. Uh, but what, what you were uh, talking about in terms of my entrepreneurial instincts as I was leading this company, I saw an opportunity. The, the, the landscape in, in the computer ecosystem was changing pretty rapidly to decentralized computing um, from the mainframe world, if you would, had it been historically a mainframe-centric world. And we had system software at Legion that was rooted initially in mainframes, and we had introduced a lot of products in the decentralized computing world, but it was my view that a clean slate, I could start a company focused only on system software for decentralized computing, that I that there was a real opportunity there. And so it was with that in mind that I actually um, uh, decided I wanted to start a company. Um, one of my associates, colleagues that I had worked with at GE, guy by the name of Art Marx was a general partner at NEA at the time. Uh, he had joined up with Chuck Newhall, one of our founders. They were both Harvard Business School classmates. He had left GE to join NEA years earlier. And he said, well, why don't you incubate um, your company at NEA? And we'll pay you for that. I said, so you're going to pay me for the opportunity to incubate my company? What's the catch? Because I don't get that. And he said, well, the catch is we get first dibs on investing behind it. We'll help you, and, but we get first dibs on investing behind it. So I thought that was a pretty good deal. So I took him up on it. And um, it wasn't exactly what I anticipated because I, I was also, I had a side job working for my uh, General Atlantic was my major shareholder at Legion. They had funded it initially uh, as a venture and I was doing some work for them in New York um, and they were trying to attract me to actually take over one of their companies. And so I had all these things pulling on me as I was trying to start this company. But the real pull happened when um, I was asked by one of the other founders, Frank Bonzel, to help him with a company up in Boston that was uh, having some issues and some challenges. And he said, look, you've just been running this public software company. Could you help this CEO out? So I felt an obligation because they were, NEA was paying me and I thought, okay, I'll, I'll help out. So I started making these trips to Boston to help the CEO out with his company. And then Frank would invariably come to me and say, well, while you're traveling to Boston, here's three business plans. Would you take a look at these companies and tell us what you think? And so I'd visit these companies, I'd come back, and I'd be sitting around the partners' meetings, and after doing this for a while, I realized, okay, I got kind of the raw end of this deal, because I'm not getting paid a lot by NEA, and I'm basically doing what these other partners are doing, and I'm not starting my company up. And um, <clears throat> so I made a comment, and uh, which is, I either need more time to start my company or something's gotta change here, but this isn't working real well. 
and um, Chuck Newhall and Art sat me down and said, well, have you thought about being a venture capitalist? And I said, well, it occurred to me sitting in these offices, but I don't know that I want to do that. And Chuck said something which really ticked me off. He said, well, we don't know that you'd be good at it, and <laughs> which was very offensive to me. And um, so they made a, prop a proposal to me. They said, look, stop what you're doing with General Atlantic, stop what you're doing on your company, focus on this for a year. At the end of the year, you'll decide whether you want to do this, we'll decide whether you're any good at it, and we'll go from there. So I, I took that bet, and the rest is history, as they say. <laughs> So your competitive juices got flowing. My competitive juices got flowing. <laughs> to this I, day, I haven't forgiven him for that. Comment. I think you've proved that <laughs> they uh, they made the right decision in, in wooing you away from your company. Before we leave that, so um, I'm a failed entrepreneur. Well, so here we sit. <laughs> I'm a failed entrepreneur. What what was your business? What market were you going for? What was your essential, you know, idea and the, business model? And well, did the you idea have the idea was to create a Legion-like company, a portfolio of multiple products in system software. So system software are the, it's the software that runs data centers. But we were now into m mini computers and, and uh, other computing platforms and decentralized computing, most importantly, which required a whole different architecture and every product that we had in our portfolio, both at UCell and at Legent, needed to be re-engineered and re-architected for this new ecosystem. Mm -hmm. And so that was the concept. And, uh, and it was a good concept, um, uh, but I never really executed it. I don't think you count as a failed entrepreneur <laughs> because you, d you didn't <laughs> get it off the ground. So this is 1972? Two is that right, or what year is it? Oh no no, this no, is uh, this you, is eighty. What year did you oh, come to NEA? I came to NEA in ninety one. I'm sorry, ninety one. I'm in the wrong. Um, so you started, you started your official. You began. Yeah, I began uh, as president of NEA Incubation Corp. That's what the job was, which today in today's parlance you would call a venture partner at a venture firm, and. Um, you know, my job was to source deals and do and, and help partners with their companies, which I did. I went on a few boards or went in as an observer on boards that needed some help where I could take my operating experience in the software world and leverage it. Um, and and I, I, looked at, uh, I looked at some companies and actually did some deals. Do you remember any from those very early years? Yeah, yeah um, the, the, I believe the first one was actually a Silicon Valley based company called Park Place Systems, founded by Adele Goldberg out of Stanford. Mm -hmm. And, and um, it was all focused on object oriented programming. And, um, and so a, a early in my career at NEA, um, I, I made a, I did a couple of deals out in Silicon Valley, even though I was on the East Coast, I decided I wanted to really understand kind of the valley and what was going on in the valley. Um, and I really just was opportunistic about what I did. And many of my early deals, I took the approach that even though I had had the experience I talked about working with early stage companies, acquiring early stage companies, whether it be at uh, GE or at UCell, we were arguably the most acquisitive company in the software industry at the time, or at Legion, also an acquisitive company, said I've never really run an early stage company and I need to learn this game from a different vantage point and so I, I, I made some early bets that were in C rounds. Hmm. 
so that I could learn from other VCs that were already sitting on the board, learn the game from them, if you will. And so that was kind of my strategic approach. Although Park Place uh, was an early round company, as was UUNet, uh, also a company I invested in it, uh, early in my career. Other bets that I made were at later stages, again with this objective of trying to learn the business from both my partners, but also other VCs that were already at the table. So it was an acknowledgement on my part that I had, I knew a lot about software companies, I knew a lot about networking, I knew a lot about the industry, but I, I really wasn't an entrepreneur and I really didn't know a lot about uh, early stage companies and financing early stage companies. So you're on this very rapid learning curve at the same time making investments. Do you remember any particular stories to tell about so these aha moments as you learned the business in those early days, a decision, a conversation? Um, yeah, well, I, I, I learned um, I learned that uh, the world can change on a dime. So, you know, there were several examples of that, but the, the, the most pronounced one was an investment in UUNet which was an early pioneer in the internet. They were the infrastructure uh, internet service provider, ultimately carried the traffic for half the internet for years. Um, but we went into that. The, uh, there was a bit of serendipity there. Um, when I sat down, it was a local Virginia company. I mean, the, the, the internet was founded by DARPA, so a lot of the technologists behind the internet actually were in the Washington DC area. Yes. I didn't know what the internet was but I was introduced to Rick Adams the founder of UUNet and he was explaining um, UUNet to me and um, I put it in the context of GE information services. So he was explaining uh, the protocol behind it, TCP IP, and the fact that it was a public networking system. And I would compare it to the networking system we had at GE that was a proprietary system. Mm -hmm. And we got into discussions where I, the aha there was that all these commercial customers that we had at GE on our proprietary system could run their applications on this internet thing at a much lower cost. Mm -hmm. And so I saw this great opportunity for commercial businesses. At that point, what people knew about the internet was all consumer focused. Mm -hmm. It was not commercially focused. Rick Adams shared that vision of commercial opportunity. I appreciated it at my core because I was an executive in the business that had those customers and those applications that I thought could migrate over to the internet over time. So I saw a great opportunity. At the time, there were a lot of regional uh, internet networks, typically focused on university data centers. And our strategy going into the investment, which we were doing um, jointly with Axel, um, was that we would do a roll-up. And ultimately, Menlo joined us in that investment. But this started out, Axel and NEA were looking at it. And our strategy was we were going to do a roll-up of these regional network providers. So we were going to come into this round, put capital at work, roll it up, build scale. Uh, Menlo, as I said, joined us in that first round, and I would say four months into our investment, the internet got discovered. And it went from uh, occasional mention in the media to uh, enveloping the media. And so uh, the hype started. And these regional networks that we had planned on acquiring now became not acquirable because their value shot up. 
And so we realized very quickly that our whole thesis overnight changed. And we were, I'll call it saddled with an investment, and we didn't have a strategy. So what did you do? Well, in that case, um, again, I kind of, uh, it, this is a little serendipity and a little opportunity. I, uh, I was able to lean on lessons I learned at G Information Services. Because we, as I said, had this time-sharing business and we had built this large global proprietary network and we had decided along the way, and this was kind of part one of my jobs, was we have a network that's filled with commercial customers using it during daytime business hours and a mm -hmm. pipe that is empty at night. Yeah. How do we leverage that empty pipe in the evening? Because it's a fixed cost, it's there. How do we leverage it? So we decided to introduce a consumer business, which ultimately be, was called Genie, and it was in the early days of Prodigy, Genie, CompuServe, AOL. Yes. I would argue if it had been executed correctly, GE would have been AOL and should have been AOL because we had the infrastructure, we had the idea. But the point was we used empty pipe. And so now we kind of reverse this and we said, well, for you, UNET, we want to build a network. Um, we, can't, we can't use the roll up, so we have to build the network. That's going to take a lot of capital to build the network, more capital than we can fund. Okay. How do we do this? So our, uh, the other competitors were taking on massive amounts of debt to f finance the build out. Um, I had recruited John Sigmore um, to uh, a, a colleague of mine from G Information Services to come in as CEO. Actually, they had asked me to take over as CEO of the company, uh, and the board did. And and um, I said I couldn't. We had just raised a fund at NEA, but I'd find the guy, and I did. From my Again, the, there was a lot of parallels between G Information Services and what UUNet was doing. So I recruited John Sigmore as well as the guy that ran our data center at G Information Services, jo uh, Joe Scorzini, to come in and run network operations. Um, and so when I had recruited him in, and so we had this aha, our world changed. So John and I, having our GE experience, together with Rick Adams, the founder, who had this commercial bent, we all got on the same page. And the page was, okay, we had this experience at G Information Services. We're trying to build a network, and the network, for commercial purposes, is used during the daytime. It's not used in the evening. Who would have an interest in using it in the evening? So I made the introduction of Steve Case, the founder of AOL, to John Sigmore. Um, AOL was going to invest, uh, uh, Steve was going to go on the board, and then AOL announced uh, an acquisition of a company called ANS, which we saw as a direct competitor. Mm -hmm. Steve didn't see it as a direct competitor, we did, so we expanded our net to include Microsoft. Long story short, we negotiated a terrific deal with Microsoft. They took a board seat, they invested in the company, and it was, and they built up a dial-up network for Microsoft services, their Microsoft services business, which competed with AOL. They knew we were talking to AOL. We frankly took advantage of that competitive dynamic between AOL and Microsoft, got Microsoft to invest heavily in the company, and basically built the network for us that we then leveraged for our commercial purposes. And so while our competitors were taking on debt, we weren't. We had, an, uh, we, we had a big daddy investor in the name of Microsoft, and it was a great collaboration for, that served their self-interest and our self-interest. Brilliant. It worked. It worked. <laughs> and UUNet went on to become the largest internet service provider. Ultimately, uh, got bought by MFS, which quickly got 
bought by WorldCom, mm -hmm. and it was the golden nugget in that portfolio. That was a big aha moment. That was a, a big aha moment. With a great story. The aha being the world can change overnight. The aha, I guess, being you can, there were some leverageable things and lessons that I had learned that were applicable to this situation, which, you know, by the way, is what venture capital is. Venture capital is pattern recognition. I, I had just had some operating experiences that provided me those useful patterns. But as you progress in your venture career, you realize that you're seeing dozens and dozens, scores of companies, and you're learning lessons and you're seeing patterns that you can apply in your decision-making process as to what investments to make and in your counseling after the fact on where to take the companies. So uh, let's talk about your role then as an investor, mentor, matchmaker, all, you know, all those things that uh, a great VC does. Um, if I were one of your investee founders, what would I say as a, you know, working with, <laughs> with, with Peter? And maybe you could tell a story of you know, wh what you saw on the other side of some of the great um, founders that you worked with. Um, what was that relationship like as you're bringing to bear yeah. your expertise and working with Well, I, I think it's important to say that the lesson that I learned in going from an operating role to a venture role, the biggest change, which was a hard change for me, was as a venture investor, you don't have your hands on the lever. As a president of a company, you do. You can dictate. Although I liked to think of myself as collaborative consensus building, at the end of the day, when a decision needed to be made, a decision got made. In the venture world, one, you're in a partnership at your firm, and so partnership consensus is important. And as it relates to the companies themselves, and I am going to get to your question, as it relates to the companies themselves, you, one, you typically don't have controlling interest, and so you have to operate through influence rather than dictate. And so it's influencing the entrepreneur, it's influencing the other board members. So to your question about how entrepreneurs would see me, hopefully what they would say is that I was collaborative, I guided them, I counseled them, I ultimately gave them the rope to make the decision. It wasn't my decision. I didn't dictate. We're, we are typically the largest, if not the largest, certainly one of the largest shareholders in the companies we invest in. But we don't dictate. We make our bets on the entrepreneur. The entrepreneur is king, and we treat them that way. Um, you know, we have an obligation to make tough decisions sometimes to replace entrepreneurs and bring in other CEOs. But absent those decisions, it's all very collaborative. And it's we're there to be a helping hand, and hopefully that's how they would say I was a helping hand. And I could um, uh, lean on my operating experience. So I've been in the venture business now for 25 years, so I guess I have to call myself a venture capitalist with some operating experience. But for a lot of my venture career, I was an operating guy that had converted to venture capitalists. And so, you know, one of the, one of the stories uh, that's kind of interesting in that regard is <clears throat> one of the earliest companies I invested in, I, as I mentioned, I came in in later rounds to learn the game. And the particular, I, I, I won't name the company, uh, but I came into a C round, and in one of our earliest meetings, I'm sitting around the table with three other venture board members in executive session. And we all had, even though they were career venture capitalists, and I was the operating guy, newbie venture capitalist, on this, we had an issue in the company. On this particular issue, we all say, saw the world exactly the same way even though our perspectives were different. And at the end of our session, we said, the comment was made, well, now we've got to go tell the CEO what we think about this and 
instruct him what he needs to do. And they all looked at me and said, Peter, would you go tell him? And I'm, I'm the new guy on the block. And they, and they said, because you, you, he'll believe you and you have more credibility with him. And I went, I have more credibility with him. Here I am, the new guy. They had been investors for several years in this company, but it was my operating experience that in their view gave me the credibility. I had sat in his seat. And so even though we all saw the world the same way, the, my delivering that message in their view was gonna have, um, um, was gonna be more impactful. And so part of my relationship, whether deserved or undeserved with my C, the CEOs, the companies I invested in, was, you know, they saw me as being a credible counselor because I sat in their seat. And that didn't mean I was always right, and that didn't mean they always agreed with me. But I had, um, and I think I had the art of persuasion from my debate days. Um, so influencing was something that I actually enjoyed. Sometimes it would be very frustrating, and I did find in one case that I could not influence either the entrepreneur or the other board members, even though some of the other board members absolutely agreed with the position I took on issues at the company, I could not influence them to take action on it, and I could not in influence the entrepreneur, and I ultimately just left the board, because I concluded, if I can't influence them, I'm not gonna dictate, and I can't dictate, really, um, time for me to lead the board, and ultimately that wasn't a good outcome for that company and that investment. But I'm going off on a tangent here. Your question about my relationship, I, I think I've, I've had very friendly relationships with uh, where I've actually built friendships, not just cordial, but friendships with, with many of the entrepreneurs I've invested behind. But I, I, all, I, I always kept one, one degree of separation because I had a responsibility to our partnership. I mean, that, that's the lesson you learn as, 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 a, as a manager coming out of the operating world. You oftentimes have to make tough decisions. And if you're the closest of friends, you can't always do that. It's mm -hmm. very difficult to do that. So, but I built very good relationships with my uh, my CEOs and tried to be very supportive um, and provide what you would expect a venture capitalist to provide. So in the UUNet example I gave you, I helped recruit several key managers into the company. I helped on some key, key decisions, strategic decisions. By the way, Microsoft, the representative from Microsoft, a guy by the name of Dan Rosen, who took a board seat, told me and told the other board members the reason Microsoft invested in UUNet and none of the other companies in the field was that management team that we had built. Mm -hmm. So, you know, hopefully I played an instrumental role in attracting some key people um, and ultimately some strategic partnerships. So, um, a, uh, a um, major vendor to UUNet was Juniper Networks, a NEA portfolio company. And it was Juniper's uh, relationship with UUNet that ultimately put it on the map. And, um, and a guy at UUNet by the name of Mike O'Dell, who was our CTO at UUNet, who today is a venture partner at NEA, uh, helped um, uh, propagate the message throughout the industry that ultimately led to Juniper being a big success and, and the CEO of Juniper would credit UUNet and John Sidgmore specifically for a lot of Juniper's success. And so we as venture capitalists help our companies. We don't force fit them. That was a natural, but we obviously made that introduction of those two companies and both companies benefited from it. Is this Pradeep? 
<coughs> this was Scott Creens that was the CEO at, uh, mm -hmm. at Juniper yeah. at the time. So I'd love to hear a story. You have, of your 25 years, you've, you've worked with so many of your CEOs. Um, can you tell about one of the ones that's really been significant to you? How did you recognize that you wanted to invest in them? How did it kind of grow and evolve? And what yeah. do you see the impact? Well, there's so many good stories. The, the uh, <coughs> you know, the, um, yeah, we're often asked as venture capitalists, do you bet on the jockey or the horse? <laughs> that's, that's one of your questions. That's one of my questions. <laughs> yeah, and I don't have a, you know, after all these years, I don't have a good answer because obviously you want both. Mm -hmm. If I had to choose, I actually picked the horse because being the market, mm -hmm. because you can change jockeys, you can't change horses. Mm -hmm. um, but that being said, I have so many examples in my career of where the jockey made all the difference. So to your question though, the, uh, and this was a bet on jockey, which is why I'm uh, telling you this story. Uh, a Groupon, which was initially called The Point, was founded by a um, was founded by a gentleman in one, one of our companies that worked in one of our companies part-time. So we're talking about uh, yeah, yeah. one of your <coughs> partnerships with yeah. the CEO. How did you recognize that this was a company worth investing in and how did that partnership begin and what's been the impact for the industry? So we, we had done several investments with um, a couple of gentlemen out of Chicago, Eric Lefkowski and Brad Keywell. We had made three investments behind them. All of them were, appeared to be winners. One of them had gone public by the time we were introduced to Groupon. And um, th these two partners, Angel invested in, the, in this company called The Point, and it was behind an entrepreneur that actually worked at one of their companies that we were investors in, Inner Workings. Andrew Mason, he was working there as a computer programmer, and also he had a, uh, he was in the graduate program at University of Chicago at the time he had just started. Um, uh, and it, the concept behind the point was essentially a website that, um, where uh, you, would, you would activate a, a contract with people on the internet around a cause. So an example of one that they gave in those days is you're a Verizon customer and you have a beef with Verizon, um, but you're powerless as one subscriber amongst millions of subscribers. But if you could go to the point and construct a contract that said, if there are 15,000, and you defined that tipping point, 15,000 other people subscribers that have this same beef, we then are a powerful force that can get change. And um, <clears throat> so the obvious question was, well, how are you going to monetize that? And the, the answer was, um, well, we're going to monetize it through advertising. And so, you know, maybe Sprint would advertise on this contract, Beef for Verizon. And, so we said, that's a really bad idea. <laughs> that's a really bad idea. But we love the fact that you're using the internet to aggregate individuals that are powerless into a forum that has leverage. And we love the fact that you define this tipping point concept, that you have no contract until you get to that tipping point, and at that point you do. And we don't know where this goes, but this business plan will not work. Mm. But we loved Andrew Mason and his creativity and his brilliance. He happened to be a Northwestern grad as an undergrad, so I like that part about him. 
we loved the fact that the angel investors who were actively involved in the company, in Eric Lefkowski and Brad Keywell, were, were fabulous operators who we knew and trusted. And that combination of that creative brilliance and their operating prowess and their brilliance in their own right was very attractive to us. Now, it was a very controversial deal in our partnership because the business plan made no sense. In fact, we were afraid of litigation, using the example I gave you, that we would get would litigated in that process. But um, I had conviction that these people were worth betting on and that they would morph this idea and those two nuggets in there of aggregating people on the internet and tipping point and turn it into a business that made sense. But it was a bit of a blind bet and it was a bet in this case on the jockey or jockeys. And so that it was in that vein that we made that bet. And um, <clears throat> they threw a lot of experiments. In fact, we tried to, you know, in our role as venture capitalists, myself and my partner, Harry Weller, tried to find companies within our portfolio that we might be able to combine with them and create something of scale. We were uh, searching for a business model. And um, in the world of happenstance and serendipity, they realized that some of their customers that were coming to the website were using it to aggregate people to buy things. And so they tested that concept with a restaurant that was in the building that they were officed in in Chicago and did a deal on, I can't even remember if it was pizza or hamburgers, just within that building. And it was a wild success where they gave them a discount and um, and they realized they were onto something, and um, and so you now had a marketing tool that for a local business that replaced all of the typical avenues that they had: yellow pages, bus uh, advertising, ta cab, cab advertising, billboards direct marketing, all of which you never really truly understood what the impact was to the money you spent. Whereas in the case of Groupon, you got a discount you, to get a new customer, but as a merchant, you, under, you only paid if you got that customer. So it was a pay for performance marketing. So we said local businesses pay for performance marketing. We think we have something here. Mm. Now we need to scale it because there are no barriers to entry and scaling it fast was, uh, was imperative. And I think that's one of the things, going back to the concept of pattern recognition, I think to this day Andrew Mason would say, I would beat on him, and I'm in a general way, but I would beat on him to scaling the business quickly. You know, okay, you're in one city, Chicago, when are you gonna be in two? When are you going to be in five? What's the plan for five? What's the plan for 20? And I'd say, look, I've never been in a business like this, but I've seen a lot of services businesses. And the only barrier you have is scale. And your formula can be replicated by anybody. So you got to get to scale quickly. And we did that. We scaled quickly both domestically and internationally. And I think that's why the company survived and prospered. And so today it's got s over $6 billion in gross revenues and 8,000 employees and it's a great company. It's a great company. Um, behind where you're sitting you have a whole shelf of tombstones. You've been involved with how many companies over your 25 years would you Oof. estimate? I don't know the number. It's a lot. <laughs> it's, it's multiple dozens. Multiple dozens. Um, is there another story of one that, uh, in addition to Groupon, which is you know one of those those ones that you hit it out of the park? Is there another one that you would point to that is particularly significant in your career? Well, I'd, I'd say there's several that I, uh, but um, 
you know, I the uh, there's a, a fairly recent one, another Chicago-based company by the name of Clever Safe that um, had a technology that was developed by an um, engineer out of MIT to uh, disperse storage in multiple locations and take slices of whatever you're storing and disperse it and then re-aggregate it. And it served the purpose of lowering cost, eliminating the need to duplicate data as is standard industry practice, and providing massive security because if you lost a data center or two or three, you could still re-aggregate your information. And it was a company that was going um, sideways for a lot of years. And um, uh, I didn't make the original investment on behalf of NEA, but I got involved because I travel a lot to Chicago, having made a number of investments there. And I started sitting in a bunch of board meetings. And, um, you know, that was one where it was the stereotypical engineering company and engineering culture that needed a needed to morph itself into more of a sales marketing organization. We knew we had great technology, but um, uh, you know companies like Shutterfly had based their business on it and hadn't lost a bit of information in several years with storing all the photos that they store. But we were still struggling to get a lot of enterprise um, uh, customers. And so uh, uh, Chris uh, Gladwin, who was the founder, and I, he, you know, he sought my counsel a lot. We had a lot of great discussions, and we agreed that we needed to bring in somebody with sales marketing expertise. And we, um, we found a guy uh, who happened to have been at Juniper Networks, one of our companies. Um, and uh, but had a long-standing career at IBM and was so he he had big company experience and he learned all the lessons but he had also been in an entrepreneurial environment and he was a sales marketing wizard and we hired him into the company and then you know what they say about A's hire A's well he is an A and he hired A's and very quickly, we uh, built a sales marketing team that was equal in strength to our technical team. And the company went through the traditional inflection. So all these years we were sitting on and not executing on this great technology. And that change, again, jockey, mm. in a, it was a great market, but it took that jockey and that expertise in sales marketing and that background in enterprise sales specifically to open up doors um, and to attract other people that could open up doors um, that made all the difference in the world and very quickly that company um, uh, hit an inflection and was sold at the end of 2015 for uh, well over a billion, 1.3 billion to IBM. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, that's a, that was a great story of having made a bet on technology, but getting back to the question of jockey, we had a great market, um, but we needed some expertise in a discipline, in this case, sales marketing, that made all the difference in the world when you married it with that great technology. But the great technology was floundering by itself. Flounder is probably too strong a word, but it was the company was growing at a modest rate. Well, thank you. We we've talked about pattern recognition that's led to success, but in venture there are so many other stories of pivots and sometimes failures. I wonder if you could share a little bit about some of the common pitfalls from either pitching people who come pitching to execution a lot or to even scaling. That some of the common pitfalls that if you were yeah. You could help avoid a little bit of the pain if you were able to, sh to share those 
pitfalls to avoid. Right. I, I think the biggest pitfall is people not knowing what they don't know and not being inquisitive. And so, um, you know, one of, one, of, uh, one of the founders I back, a um, guy by the name of Rob McGovern, who was the founder of a company by the name of Career Builder, um, he exemplified to me what makes great entrepreneurs. And that is, he's a very inquisitive mind, always learning, willing to experiment, and willing to cut losses quickly. So he didn't pretend he knew the answer to everything. That's, you know, er, one of my partners early in my career at NEA used to have a saying, concrete ears. And we'd sit in presentations and we'd have dialogue with entrepreneurs that were presenting and we'd make an assessment as to whether they were listening to us. Listening doesn't mean agreeing. Listening means just that. We sensed that they were hearing what we said and they were processing it. Oftentimes what we see is an entrepreneur that's got a plan. And when you ask a question that may be a little challenging, they get defensive and they protect their domain, if you will, and their plan and they try to justify it. There's nothing wrong with that in and of itself, but if they weren't listening to what we said and really thinking about it, you know, it's one thing to say, good question, I thought about that, and here's what I concluded, or good question, I'll look into it, or that's not a good question and here's why, but you're listening rather than dismissing. That's the first sign of an entrepreneur that's going to likely going to fail because Startups invariably hit bumps in the road. And if you don't take stock of that bump in the road and why you experience that bump in the road and react to it, you're going to lose. There are entrepreneurs with blinders that keep going in the same direction that say, I have the answer and I'm going to keep executing against it regardless of what the market's telling me regardless of what board members are telling me, regardless of what customers and friends are telling me, I'm going to trudge forward. Those people typically fail. So Rob McGovern's a guy that says, I'm going to listen to the market, I'm going to experiment, I'm going to take that feedback, and if that feedback tells me I'm going down the wrong path, I'm going to make that assessment quickly, and then I'm going to move on. And that, to me, is what makes a great entrepreneur. And um, so... Most, you know, unless you're just downright lucky, most entrepreneurs, the successful ones, are smart. But smarts alone don't delineate winners from losers. It's things like this. It's listening, um, being humble, and that's what this is. It's be, I don't have all the answers. Let, let, let me listen to what I'm, the, the data I'm getting. Let me gather that data aggressively and react to it. That's the mark of a great entrepreneur. It's a great insight to share. You've been involved with so many companies and helping create them and build them. Um, I want to make sure that for the record, we you're not too modest in naming some of those others that you've, we've talked about Groupon, you mentioned Career Builder, um, other ones that you of the pantheon of companies that you've been involved yeah. with and what stands out to you about how you look at their turning points and their impact. Yeah, well, I, me I mentioned I mentioned you, you know, which is early in my career, and, um, you know, there were companies like, I mean, I won't go into all the details, like Park Place, like Data Logics, like Salix. I know I'm going to leave companies out um, that were all successful companies um, and made marks on their on their respective industries. You know, it, it, we, you know, we had 10x investments. There was a, a company in Texas that remains a private, very successful company today by the name of Trilogy Development. Mm -hmm. Trilogy was a, uh, a very, 
It was founded by the the uh, son of my mentor, Greg Lemont from GE, the guy that Amazing. hired me out of Tuck. Amazing. And he dropped out of Stanford to start Trilogy, and he's been a wild success ever since. Um, Mission Critical, a Houston-based company, also a, a great return in the system software arena, going back to kind of my roots. Um, these were uh, that all companies where the, I would say, back to your question, all the founders were wanted to make a mark on the world, and they had a mission. And, um, and, and so it was an amazing experience for me to work alongside these very uh, ambitious, intelligent, creative, passionate people in different areas, you know, from the Groupons of the world that are going after consumers um, uh, to the Unionets of the world that are heavy duty networking infrastructure. Um, the common thread through them all is they were all founded by people that had passions for what they were doing and were principled in what they were doing. And by principled, I mean they didn't take shortcuts, whether it had to do with their business, whether it had to do with how they treated employees, they didn't take shortcuts. And, and so it's been a fabulous experience for me to be able to take what I learned in the earlier part of my career and leverage it into this environment, which is, you know, every day is a new day. There's no repeats. Um, uh, the the um, this isn't a question you ask, but I'm going the the interesting thing about when I was asked very early in my transition from an operating job to venture capital what what were some of the differences and I you know one was I don't have my hands on the lever as a VC and the highs are not as high and the lows are not as low mm -hmm. when you're an entrepreneur or you're dedicated to a company, if there's a crisis at that company, you live and die on what's going on at that company. Certainly when we invariably hit roadblocks at the companies that, that uh, we invest in, we lose sleep as venture capitalists. If you're a good venture capitalist, you care and you'll lose sleep. But you don't live and die on one company. So those lows are not as low as the people but neither are the highs, because although you're part of the broader team that made it happen, you're not part of the team that made it happen. And when they, when they succeed, their highs are unbelievable highs. And so it's, uh, that's a difference, but that's also, it's great to be a participant in that and an observer of it. And, and those successes are fabulous. But you learn a lot in the failures too, quite frankly, and the failures aren't always the doing of the entrepreneur or the management team. Sometimes you just get bad breaks in markets. Things go awry, regulation changes. You find out that the satellite you launched is next to a Chinese military satellite and they don't like you there in their neighborhood, so they decide to jam you, unanticipated. <laughs> I, um, as you say, not everything is up and to the right, and um, the learning sounds like you've been not only bringing your tremendous expertise and experience, but also learning along the way. Would you be open to sharing some of the challenges that you've seen um, as an investor, some of the, something you missed maybe, something, um, any disappointments, or have you? Yeah, oh, well, un unfortunately, that's a long list, too. Um, you know the old saying, don't go into areas you don't understand. So I just made light of this example of a Chinese satellite. We got a, a, uh, an entrepreneur that came into our office one day with, a, with another investor who was focused in the satellite world, and he had this audacious idea that he was going to launch 
satellites to provide, I'll call it direct TV kinds of applications in Asia, mm. inclusive of India and Vietnam and Cambodia, not China, because China had regulations that didn't allow that. Um, and uh, But launching a satellite is an expensive proposition, and one would say not one for venture capitalists to venture into. But he was so compelling as a, a as an entrepreneur who understood the space and thought and, and grew up in the satellite business and thought he could get his hands on a satellite that was ironically built for a, a, a Chinese customer but our US State Department stopped it from being delivered there and he thought he could get it I'll call it at a fire sale price long story short we and the other investors said, look, we'll give you some walk-around money, a million and a half from us, a million and a half from the other investor, and if you can go out and secure the satellite, secure a slot in space, and secure an anchor tenant, we'll fund you behind that. that those, that's a very that's high a, bar. That's a right? lot of big ifs. Long story short, he delivered on all three. We had an anchor tenant in India, we had a slot with a perfect footprint, and we had the satellite. And so we raised capital to fund the purchase of the satellite. This was a, ultimately 100 to $150 million over time rather than multiple hundreds of millions of dollars. So we took on debt. We became the buzz of the satellite industry. We launched two satellites. That was that one and another one. And as I said, and, and we, we had one of the founders of DirecTV on our board. So we knew the space, so to, no pun intended, um, but we got this curveball. And the curveball was that we were sitting in a slot next to a Chinese military satellite. And to this day, I don't, they probably assumed we had US intelligence, which we didn't, on our satellite. Um, and we were espionage, which we weren't, but um, through a whole series of events that involved international wheeling and dealing. We were dealing with Singapore and Bermuda and France, and I won't get into it all. This was international politics, not something I had a lot of experience with. We ended up losing all of our equity in what was a great idea, and was successfully executed up to the point of this curveball. Now, ultimately, those satellites were moved to different slots, but the equity holders lost their money. And so it's a successful business, less successful than it would have been had it, they stayed in the same slot. So great idea, great execution against all odds, but we weren't experts in the satellite space and we got a curveball that was unanticipated. And so don't play in areas that you don't understand well, because we didn't understand the nuances of the satellite business and the poli international politics behind it. And, and so, uh, you know, hard lesson learned. I'd like I to haven't invested in another satellite <laughs> business since. <laughs> <laughs> That uh, <laughs> one was enough. <laughs> one was enough. <laughs> I'd like to pull the lens back now. Thank you for talking about your amazing experience as a venture investor. And let's look at you within NEA. When you came here about 25 years ago, it was a well-established firm, and you were joining a place that had a culture, mm -hmm. partners. Can you talk about... Um, those your role becoming managing partner and yeah. how you've you've seen um, your role in in continuing to build the firm through incredible yeah. time of expansion of funds and also perpetuating what's kind of been a remarkable time of the sort of now generations of, of leaders. It's rare in the venture business. It is. It is, and I think for one one of the things that attracted me to NEA was its collaborative, team-oriented environment. 
that's a I think a, a uh, uh, an anchor part of our culture and um, uh, I grew up in that kind of an environment in the various jobs I had and the companies that I managed that was the kind of culture I tried to perpetuate and it really goes back to the culture frankly at Tuck and so very team oriented and so I liked that about NEA very much um, the um, I knew some. I had gotten to know some of the people living in the Washington area, so that that made the decision to join NEA specifically uh, easier for me. And I obviously was attracted to the venture business. Our founders are the three founders of our firm: uh, Dick Kramlick, Chuck Newhall, and Frank Bonzel are all amazing people in their own right. Uh, Dick grew up the venture industry. Um, you know, Frank came out of Alex Brown and Chuck out of T. Rowe Price, but they both worked with small companies. And they were true venture capitalists when I knew them. That, that was their business. But I think by their own admission, they weren't managers. And I think what they saw in me was somebody who had a lot of experience on the operating side of the business. And I talked about leveraging that experience as it related to the companies I invested in, but it was also leverageable within the confines of NEA. And I think we had reached the stage, I joined in the middle of NEA's fifth fund uh, and participated in the fundraising in NEA 6, where uh, you'd have to ask them, but apparently they saw something in me where they, they asked me to take on a leadership role at the firm, which I did coincident with our NEA 7 fundraise. And, um, you know, through we, I'd say we made a marked change um, in around the year 2000. We were always a large firm um, by most venture standards, but um, people, including our limiteds, had a hard time understanding, just to put this in context, NEA5 was a $200 million fund, which was called a mega fund back then. Mm -hmm. It was. Yeah, it, w it was. <laughs> it was a mega fund. And, um, you know, how could you prudently invest 200 or 250 million, which was the size of our NEA6 investment? Now, I, I came from my early career at GE, a big company. And so, you know, I, I'd talked to limiteds that talked about the size of NEA, and I'd say, NEA is a popcorn stand. What are you talking about? This is a small firm. It's not even as big as most law firms. And uh, I, I, for better or for worse, I came with that perspective. GE always defied the experts in the industry because they didn't understand how such a large, diversified firm could outpace mm -hmm. the GDP yeah. year after year, decade after decade. They didn't understand it. They thought of it as an index, should be an index, but it outperformed. I kind of came with that same mentality to NEA. Okay, we're viewed as a large venture firm, but there's no reason we can't outperform uh, the industry. We're not an index. We don't need to be an index. We're still a relatively small part of the capital in the industry, single digits. Uh, so we're hardly an index, but people view us in many respects as an index. And people viewed size of firm as a negative, and that was frankly used against us by our competitors as we're too big to mm -hmm. care, we're too big to be involved, we're too big, too big, too big. So my view was let's use size to our advantage rather than be defensive about our size. And so, particularly as we went from NEA 9 to NEA 10, we jumped into the multi-billion dollar fund from an 800 million-ish fund, which was large, to a 2.3 billion dollar fund. Coincident with that, we, we expanded our strategy internationally. We expanded our strategy into growth equity, which today is very commonplace for a venture firm. It wasn't then at all. Nobody did it out of the true, 
the folks that did growth equity were growth equity firms or they were private equity firms the going downstream. There weren't venture firms mm -hmm. doing growth equity. So we had a very simple strategy. What are we good at? Well, we have a lot of, we, we know how to build and grow companies and we have a skill set at doing that. We have amazing domain expertise, whether it be in healthcare or technology and subsectors within them. We had built up an organization with a lot of expertise. And we had a large capital base. So our view was anything we could do that took advantage of those business building skills, our domain expertise, and our capital base was fair game as long as it was legal. And so we looked at the world differently than the traditional venture capital firm would look at the world. And that's what got us into growth equity, frankly, because we found a number of opportunities. It started actually in the healthcare side of our business and specialty pharma, where we saw that we could take um, uh, uh, pharmaceuticals that were in development from different companies that were orphaned for whatever reason, strategy shift, a merger, and we could buy them and aggregate them in a, in a certain discipline cancer therapy, neurology, whatever the case may be, and create a company. And so with a lot of capital, a, a lot being 40, 50 million dollars, not four or five million dollars, we could aggregate these pharmaceuticals that were in development. We could take entrepreneurs that we knew and attract them to the company and we, we could create a company. And this was a series A investment in a company that had multiple products. So then we, we, we looked at the tech world and said, came to the same conclusion uh, in a company uh, that was uh, actually a foreign company that was public, that was changing its strategy and wanted to get into new markets. It needed $200 million to make an acquisition and it, that was out of the realm of the typical VC and it was too small and too risky for the typical private equity and we said, here's a white space that we can go into because we have a large capital base. This has a lot of venture risks associated with it. We know how to embrace those risks. We're comfortable embracing those risks. And it's an area that other VCs can't go into or are unwilling to go into, and private equity firms are unwilling to go into. And so we can carve out a, we can carve out a discipline here. And so that's what led us into growth equity. But it was all about taking advantage of our large size and actually, and, and now building portfolios within our larger portfolio of companies in like spaces or in the same domain where they then could learn from each other and collaborate with each other. Um, taking advantage of the fact that we had information across a wide spectrum of companies and if we could share that information with our individual investments, size and scale now became an advantage. So I like to think and our limited partners tell us that we're the first and perhaps the only pure venture firm that has operated at scale. And some of that goes back to uh, at least in part, my leadership and my experience at GE and being not only unafraid of scale, but seen as, as a tool and an advantage and seeing that you could at scale outperform and not be an index, as I said earlier. And so we've kind of embraced that as a firm being different than the typical venture firm, but hopefully being very effective at the same time. Well, you've defined that scale. Mega fund is now a whole new area. Yeah. I think this is just finished Fund 16 this Fund 16 is a $3.3 billion dollar fund. So after a handful of more than $2 billion, now you've crossed the $3 yeah. billion threshold. So we have. That's, uh, it's amazing. Um, you, we've talked about uh, this evolution of the firm is dependent not only on leadership, um, but also the relationship among the partners right. as you've, and in somewhat an unusual bi-coastal 
Right. Um, we were founded by Coastal. Founded by Coastal, operating by Coastal, and now international. Can you give us a window on, on that dynamic of how you work together and have, have evolved the firm? Yeah, the, well, as I mentioned from the outset, our founders established a culture here that was team oriented. And, that, and how did they do that? Well, they had a very flat compensation structure. We operated then and today out of one fund. So whether, if you're investing in China, you have an interest in how the rest of the fund is doing, which means you're incented to help partners in the U.S. and U.S. partners to help partners in China, and healthcare partners to help tech partners and vice versa. We're all feeding out of the same trough. And so that, that incents us monetarily to work together, but culturally it's about team and it's about helping each other. And so, the, so we were founded with that premise, and we were founded with the premise of working in partnership with our limited partners that, uh, and our entrepreneurs as they're our customers, and we're a service support organization, if you will, and we have to build up um, strong partnerships with those two constituent groups, obviously very different constituent groups. One. Back in the day, you used to wear a tie to see, and the others you didn't, right? And so you had, two, on, right? you had two wardrobes, right? Yeah, you're straddling um, those. Right, exactly. And you're still straddling those two constituent groups. But what it translated into in the way of, in, in terms of entrepreneurs, was this very entrepreneur friendly, collaborative culture. What does that look like in practice? Many people talk about those ideals. Yeah. But when it's kind of feels like nitty-gritty practice. What does that Well, what it means like? is when um, uh, when the uh, shit hits the fan, to use the proverbial phrase, excuse the language, um, you are a helping hand and you roll up your sleeves and you work with the entrepreneur to solve the problems, to meet the challenges. You don't, I'll, just to be dramatic, pound your fist on the table and make demands, uh, which I have seen some of my colleagues in the industry do. When the time, you know, you know I always tell an entrepreneur, we're going to do due diligence on you when we're looking at a new investment. You should do due diligence on us and any other venture firm mm -hmm. you're working on. And oh, by the way, here's our phone book. It's got every entrepreneur we've ever backed. Feel free, I'll give you the list of people that know me well, but if you wanna randomly call people up, feel free to do so, to find out what we are like as a firm. And as it relates to me and relates to the companies, I would suggest you not call the big high-flying winners. Call the companies that ultimately were successful, but they went through rough patches to get there. Mm. Because those are the situations where you learn the most about the venture investor, and you learn the most about the value add they provide. In the straight up and to the right situations, it's all kumbaya. Everybody's friends and everybody did a great job, right? It's when you hit, hit tough times that you find out um, who the real helpful partners are. And we find that out in terms of other VCs, quite frankly. You know, there are VCs I won't work with because I've had bad experiences in those rough times. And the same should be true for entrepreneurs. And so we have an attitude, and, the, and, and that's part of our culture. And the culture is, sits in the discussions we have at partners' meetings where we give examples and we talk about challenges that we're, that we're facing at companies, struggles that we're having at companies or the companies are having, and we talk about how we act and what's the right thing to do. So there are often times where we're faced with a decision, whether it be with an entrepreneur or a limited par partner, where uh, option A may be in our self-interest. 
but option B is the right thing to do for that limited partner and their interest or that company and its interest. And we get to option B. And it's only by having those discussions with young people sitting in the room and observing that we're making a decision that isn't always in our best interest, but it's the right thing to do. You build a culture. It's by repeating that time and time again. They understand what our value system is and how we, the principles that we have, and I, we manage ourselves to. And that doesn't always mean doing what's in our self-interest. And so that's how you build culture, through example, through action, not through, yes, we have mission statements, and yes, we have bullets about what our culture is, but it all comes down to how do we act, and how do we act particularly in tough times with tough decisions. And it's those examples that resonate with people and, and, and um, which they take to the bank, so to speak, and, and I think which perpetuates the culture. And when we recruit people to the firm, we talk about this. And we talk about our culture and our team orientation. Um, you know, there, we, we once had two associates that were, one was particularly competitive with the other. And they had both graduated out of the same business school in the same class. And, and, um, and it was becoming destructive. And I, during a performance review, I told the one associate, I said, look, next year when we sit down at this performance review, I'm going to measure you on one thing and one thing only. He says, what's that? How successful you make that other guy. And his mouth dropped. He didn't understand. He didn't comprehend what I was talking about. We're about team. This is not about your, indivi your individual performance is helping make that guy successful. If there's plenty of room for people to succeed here, this isn't a zero-sum game. You can all win. And, and so internal competition is not our culture. And so that was, so it's examples. It's living them, breathing them. That's how you build culture. That's a challenge as we've scaled our organization. That's a lot harder to do in a large organization and to perpetuate that. So, but that's how we've done it. It, it. We've done it through the kind of discourse that I've described through following through and living it and communicating it and demonstrating it day in, day out. NEA is a very special place in a... Um we like to think it is a special <laughs> place. It's, a, it's definitely unique within our industry, I think. So if you were to sum up what makes it distinct? And in this scan of history, how has it contributed not only to the significance of the venture industry, but more broadly into the economy and, and sort of on, on society? What would you say? Well, you know, you, you, you could say for a lot of venture firms, not just NEA, we've helped create some really significant companies that have created jobs, that have supported families, that have helped the economy at large, um, that have made a mark on society, that have transformed lives, uh, hopefully for the better. Certainly, I, I envy our, our partners in the healthcare side that are contributing clearly to the health and well being of people every day and helping to solve intransient problems. And um, so, what, what makes NEA a little different? I think um, we've done it our way. We've done it in a very honest, um, in a uh, high integrity way. And I, I feel like we've made that commercial impact, that economic impact, but we've done it the right way. And that's what I feel good about. And I've, I think we've demonstrated to our industry that you can operate this industry at scale. This industry has struggled between being a cottage industry 
and growing up. It's always had some tension there. And like our companies are small, a lot of VCs have always believed they have to be small, to be nimble. Whereas I believe actually we can be more nimble as a large organization because we can get to the answer of whatever question there is faster because we either have the expertise in-house or we have the network and because that we can get to the answer quickly whether it be on an investment we're anticipating making or a company we've already invested in that network is powerful and it's powerful because it gets back to our culture when you have entrepreneurs that have enjoyed working with you they want to help you long after you have exited um, your investment you're still friends in many cases your collaborators your people that they recommend to their counterparts in the industry your people they want to help if they can help because you helped them and so that network is a very strong network in our case and is one we can lean on and we've learned how to do it in an efficient fashion and that makes that's very it's a very powerful tool and I think so I think that's a mark that we've made on our industry figuring out how to do that and demonstrating it in action what's next for the industry as you said there's it's it's changed rapidly not only in the last 25 years but even the last five years different models different yeah. um, styles different focuses what what do you see as the sort of where the venture industry is heading particularly sort of wins that are facing some challenges as well as new opportunities? I think the wins that are facing today uh, um, are fleeting, frankly. I think the, the, uh, I see a very bright future for our industry. Um, you know, I, I mentioned early in my career when I, was, when I was at Tuck, I was thinking big company, right? Because that's what people did then. Now, you know, I have a daughter that's in business school right now, and she's going to go out and work for a startup. And, it's, and, and you know, maybe I had something to do with that because she got exposure to it, but, but that's, that's more the norm today, mm -hmm. um, that people coming out of college, coming out of graduate schools are very interested in the entrepreneurial environment. Um, and, and so I think that bodes very well. At the same time, what you've seen happening in corporate America is less innovation. You know, the Bell Labs of the world no longer exist. There's less, that's the first thing that's getting squeezed in our relentless effort to deliver quarterly earnings. R&D budgets are getting squeezed down. Numbers of patents are going down. Um, particularly in the biopharma space. So where do you get your innovation? You've got to find it, and where do you find it? You find it in entrepreneurial companies. One of the biggest changes that we've seen in the industry is we're now, as a firm, getting courted by these large enterprises because they want access to our portfolio, again, an advantage of scale, um, because they know that they've got to lean on firms like us and the companies under in our portfolio for their innovation. And so they're forging partnerships with us, and we're more than happy to forge those partnerships. So I think the collaboration between industry and venture capital has never been as strong as it is today. It was always reasonably strong in healthcare, but it's gotten stronger in healthcare, and it's it's, it's light years better in the technology side than it used to be. And I think that's going to continue uh, to happen. I think interest on the part of government in venture capital um, has never been greater than it is today because they recognize the fact that net job growth in the U.S. over the last 30 years has come primarily from, if not exclusively, from venture-backed companies, net job growth. So we all talk in the political world about job growth. Where's that coming from? The creators of that job growth 
are largely coming from these venture-backed startups. So I think the future is very bright for our industry. W will we have challenges along the way? Yes, yes, undoubtedly. Um, but I think it's a great place if somebody wanted to have a career in venture capital. I couldn't think of a better time. I mean, that's the one regret I it's not the only regret I have for being old now, being in this industry for 25 years, but that's certainly one big regret, is that I'm at the tail end of my career rather than the beginning of my career. Well, you have many years ahead of you. On that perspective, um, we've talked primarily focused on U.S. I think it's been a little bit tested in our conversation, and many people are so interested in what's happening in Beijing, the venture industry, more dollars you know, going to regions outside of the U.S. and a lot of increasing innovation and major companies in the tech space um, yeah. and others um, coming. What's your perspective on entrepreneur ecosystems in the U.S. vis-a-vis -vis what's happening globally? Well, for one, let's start with the U.S. The, 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 you know, Silicon Valley has always been kind of the epicenter, at least in recent decades, the epicenter of entrepreneurial activity, and it continues to be. However, it's not the only place. And so we have great, have had great success in, uh, in places like Chicago and Boston and Austin and Seattle and Denver and emerging places, big places like New York City that are placing big bets. Um, so innovation is happening everywhere, and the reasons behind it are in great part uh, technology allows it to, to uh, succeed and blossom in other places. You, you can be in Des Moines, Iowa, and, have, uh, and, and create a successful company. It's always better if you're an easier, if you're in an ecosystem like the Valley, but there's nothing that stops you from doing it in other places. And so that's true globally as well. Um, and, uh, you know, part of that is culture, right? You have to have people that are willing to take those risks and think about themselves differently. And the millennials do. They do. And so people coming out of colleges today are kind of looking at the excitement of startups and they're willing to take those risks. So entrepreneurship is not confined to the valley any longer. Um, that's true elsewhere, okay? So w we're seeing the rise of venture capital dollars uh, uh, in approximate numbers. I think it was um, 20 years ago was over 90% of the venture capital dollars in the world went into the U.S. 10 years ago it was something like 80%, and today it's just over 50%. So our market share, the U.S. market share of venture capital is going down. Now that's not necessarily because we're losing. The pie's gotten bigger. Our, the, the dollars in our industry has remained relatively steady to up in the last several years. So it's not that we're not a growing or, or a contracting industry, quite the contrary. We're a growing industry in the U.S. It's just the rest of the world is growing faster. Now, nothing beats the U.S. in terms of where innovation is happening, though. The rest of the world, and I'm painting a broad brush, is largely a big percentage of what they do copies what we do in the U.S. It's the European version or the Indian version or the Chinese version of a success story in the U.S. That's beginning to change and you definitely see pockets of true innovation particularly in China and as their university system has come along in a significant way particularly on the technical side I expect that trend to accelerate it's starting to happen, it's, but selective, selectively in India, and same in Europe, um, and South America for that matter. You have great a great pocket of innovation in Israel that's always been true innovation, but in a relatively narrow space. 
uh, um, and they suffer from the fact that they don't have a market, a big market, and so they have to go to the U.S. or some other large market, Europe or whatever. Um, so I don't think the lead that the U.S. has is likely to evaporate anytime soon, but it is getting challenged, just like our university systems are getting challenged. You can go to the same trend in terms of top universities in the world, the number in the U.S. is decreasing. We still have the majority, but it's decreasing. And so we are a global world, we're an interconnected world, no matter what the politicians like to say, and we depend on each other, and rather than fight it, we want to take advantage of it. So that's why we as a firm have, have spread our sites um, for the last 15 years internationally. Uh, you've been so generous, Peter, with your time. I'd like to ask just two final sure. questions. One is looking back and um, at your life, we, um, we think about sort of how do we measure success and what's been most significant. How would you sum up your own areas of, of success or impact? Yeah, well, um, you know, it gets back to what I said earlier. I, I, I think I've had several different successes in my career, both in kind of my operating side of my career as well as the venture side of my career. Um, uh, I, I like to think that um, throughout my career uh, I, I did it my way, so to speak. I had um, conviction about what I was doing and, and, I did, and I had principles and I stuck to those principles and I acted in a high integrity way. Hard to measure, hard to look back on a piece of paper and say those things, but that's what I'm most proud of. Um, I think I made a mark. I think I, uh, you know, succeeded in climbing the ladder, so to speak, and, and do, had, had very a number of successes in my career at GE. Uh, did a, um, a public turnaround, two public turnarounds actually, <coughs> as it turns out, um, and um, those companies went on to prosper and had excellent exits um, and then you know NEA I like to think I made my mark in taking this firm to the next level from what I was handed when I was given the reins and building an enterprise that uh, that I and all of our partners could be proud of. It's been such a pleasure really to talk with you the last question I have is looking forward um, I asked you earlier today if you had a word of advice for a young entrepreneur or a, a, a fledgling VC. What would that be and why? Could you share that with us now? Well, the word I shared with you was one I've used a couple of times uh, in, in our session today, and that is conviction. Because um, whether you're a venture capitalist that's contemplating an investment and your partners are asking you all the hard questions and being skeptical um, or you're an entrepreneur that's getting that's hitting a rough patch you've got to have conviction about what you're doing you can't let the noise get you down and if if you have conviction and you believe sincerely, deeply about what you're doing and why you're doing it, and you work hard, as the cliche goes, you can achieve anything. And that's true in the entrepreneurial word, world, it's true anywhere. Well, your life has uh, certainly shown that. So, um, for the record, I'm Marguerite Gong Hancock of the Exponential Center at Computer History Museum here with Peter Barris. Thank you very much. Thanks. I've enjoyed it. It's been a great pleasure. Thank, Thank you. you.